Hello. Ah. Come on. There we go. All right. So we're on 7.1, and we're going to talk about the area problem. So here's a y-axis, and here's an x-axis. And what we want to do from some point A to some point B is we want to find the exact area underneath this curve. That's the goal. Let's pick that, make that a little bit bigger. There we go. So we want to know what this area here is. Here we go. Now, this thing right here, this blue section, is called a region with curvilinear boundaries. And that sounds more complicated, McKenna, than what it really is. All it means is that one of the boundaries is a curve. Now, we know that from geometry, if you have a rectangle that's length and width, the area of the rectangle is what? Length times width. Now, they didn't always call it length and width. Sometimes they called it base and height. So if that's the case, then it's just base times height. So we know that from geometry. We know that the area of a triangle Yeah, the area of a triangle is equal to one half the base times the height. We know the area of a circle, pretend that's a circle, What's the area of a circle? Pi r yeah, pi r squared. So we know how to find the areas of simple geometric shapes, these guys right here. But this guy does not qualify as a simple geometric shape. So now we've got a problem, hence the area problem. We want to find the area of that region, and so what we're going to end up doing is we're going to end up using simple geometry as a way of approximating the area underneath the curve. Okay. So far so good? Okay, what does this word mean again, curvilinear? At least one of the sides is a curve. Now, by curvilinear boundaries, it could be all the sides. We're not going to have that today. We're just going to have one of the sides as a curve. Okay? All right, can I clear that out? All right. So now I'm going to draw a larger y-axis and a larger x-axis. And here is point A, here is point B. And this right here is the function f of x. So, we want to find the area underneath the curve And so what we do is we chop up the curve into rectangles. So I'm going to chop this curve up into n rectangles. Now what I've just done here, 
Now we could count this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what I've really done here, Carrie, is I've cut it up into eight rectangles. But we're going to pretend that there are n of them. n rectangles total. Now this notation here, a sub n, this represents the approximate area using n rectangles. Now, I know you're writing your notes, but just real quick look up here on the board where my cursor is. This down here on the x-axis is called a subinterval. Okay? So is this part right here. So what we've just done is we've cut the x-axis up into how many subintervals? Eight. Literally eight from what I've drawn. N. But we're right, we're pretending that there are n of them. So what I'm going to do here, McKenna, is I'm going to put a little ellipsis on the inside, and that ellipsis means can keep going on and on and on, pretend that it keeps going on and on and on. So this part right here is the width. And true or false, the width of each rectangle is the same. True. That's true. So the first thing I need to teach you this morning is how do you get the width of each rectangle. Well what you do is you take B minus A and you divide it by the number of rectangles and that's the width of each rectangle. We're gonna call this Delta X. We're gonna call this Delta X. Now David what I'm gonna... The, the width change in x is the width? Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. So this point right here, this is the point a plus delta x. Where uh, is this point right here? Uh, a, a plus 2 delta x. 2 delta x. That's exactly right. Do you see that? Yeah. This point right here? Three delta x. Now remember, we're doing n rectangles, not the eight that we can count. Okay. So where is this one right here? Think delta x. Oh, that's an excellent. Wow. Yeah, that, that's perfect. That is b minus delta x. Yes. But in terms of a, it's a plus. N minus one delta x. Remember, we're pretending we have how many rectangles? N of them. So this is one less. Now, this point right here is B, right? But that's going to be at A plus N delta X. But that's okay, because what is delta X again? It's B minus A over N, right? So that becomes A plus N times B minus A over N. The n's divide away, the a's cross out, so it just becomes b. Okay? So the widths are all the same. Are we agreed? Okay? Now what I'm going to do here, Carrie, is I'm going to use something called the right hand rule. This is how the right hand rule works. What I do, McKenna, is for each subinterval, I use the right hand point as a sample for the height. So here's the first subinterval. I'm going to use this point as a sample in the function to get the height of the rectangle. So this right here represents the first rectangle. Now, do you see that this first rectangle is an over-approximation? Yeah. Yeah, because it goes out over, a little bit over the function, right? 
So right here, David, here's the second subinterval. I'm going to use the right hand point. Now, if one's an over, do all of them have to be over? Not necessarily. As a matter of fact, we're going to see that some of these rectangles are not over approximations. It depends more on the way the function looks. Okay. Right here, Carrie, here's the third subinterval. So I'm going to use the right hand point as a sample for the height, plug it into the function, get the height of the rectangle. If you wanted to get the exact, which we're going to eventually do, but right now we just want to get an approximate. Here's another subinterval. I take the right hand point as a sample for the height. Here's another subinterval. I sample the right hand side for the height. Now, notice that this one right here, though, what's different about this one? It's an under approximation because we're still using the and notice that the function goes down here, it's decreasing here. So when I use the right hand point of the subinterval, it goes up to a point on the function which is lower than here. Okay. Okay. So with the right hand rule, you just use the right hand side of each subinterval. By the way, there are two other rules I need to teach you. And what's one of those other rules? Yeah, the left-hand rule, <laughs> which means you use the left. And then there's another one. Maybe you can figure out what, what is it? Midpoint. midpoint. Yeah, we're going to use the midpoints. That's exactly right. Okay, now, do you see that if I add up all of these rectangles, I'll have something hopefully close, right? So if I take the first rectangle, I'll call this R1, R2, R3, R4, dot, 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 up to Rn minus 1, Rn. Add up all those areas, that gives me an approximate area, is what that does, by adding them all up. Okay? That's the basic overall idea. So now we're actually going to do it on the function. Can I go ahead and erase this? Okay. So let's take y equals x on the closed interval from 0 to 1. And let's first find a sub 1. Now carry a sub 1 is the area, the approximate area, using only one subinterval. So this is going to be pretty straightforward. Here's the line y equals x from 0 to 1. And I'm only going to use one subinterval to find the area underneath. Well, what does one subinterval look like? Actually, not a triangle. That's the, the area of the triangle is what I'm trying to find. See, one, one subinterval is this right here. So I'm going to use, again, the right hand rule. And what I do, okay, now again, how do we find delta x? Right? What is b? 1 minus 0 all over 1. So the width of this rectangle is going to be 1. So McKenna, the right-hand rule says sample this right-hand point to get the height of the rectangle. 
and so this is the rectangle we're looking at. Now remember this is supposed to be an approximation. You can already see it's going to be a bad one, right? Okay. Alright. Now, what is the area of this rectangle? It's equal to the width, which is 1, times the height, which is 1, so the area is 1, and that's a sub 1. Does that make sense? A sub 1 is the most boring. <laughs> now we'll do a sub 2. So here's 1. We're still looking at the function y equals x on the closed interval from 0 to 1. But this time we're going to let take two subintervals. So we're going to find a sub 2. So how is this going to work? Well, it's going to work like this. Now, what is delta x? What do I do to get delta x again? Yeah. 1 minus 0 over 2. So the width of each of these rectangles is 1 half. That's the width of them. Okay. Now, what's the height of the first rectangle? 1 half. 1 half. It's the... It's the value here, the x value here, plugged into the function. So the width is 1 half, the height is 1 half. So for the first rectangle, it's 1 half times 1 half. Plus the second rectangle, it's 1 half times 1. So this becomes 1 fourth plus 1 half, which is 3 fourths. Now, that's still not very good, is it? But it's at least better than the first one we found. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Can I erase this? Okay. So now let's find a sub 3. Now remember, a sub 3 is the approximate area found using three subintervals. So what we have to do now is we have to trisect all this. That's exactly right. So the width of each rectangle now is one third. I could be using the left-hand rule, by the way, but I don't want to confuse you overly, so I'm just going to stick with the right-hand rule for now. So this forms three rectangles. Delta x, we've already decided, is equal to one-third. Okay, so what is the area of the first rectangle? The width is one-third. What is the height? One third. So one third times one third. That's one ninth is the area of the first rectangle. Okay. The width of the second rectangle is one third. The height is two thirds. So one third times two thirds is two ninths. And then lastly, one third times one, which is one third. All right, got a little bit of a conundrum here because I have to get common denominators to add them all up, right? So I'm going to turn that 1 third into a 3 over 9. And now I can finally add them up. That adds up to 6 ninths, which reduces, by the way, to what? 2 thirds. So the approximate area now for a sub 3, 
Again, what is capital A sub 3 again? Can you give that back to me? It's the approximate area under the curve using three subintervals. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, for laughs and giggles. Let's find a sub 10. Let's see here. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Still using the right hand rule. Now, what's something that's happening here, by the way? Does anybody see what's happening? That's exactly right. As what happens? Right. As the number of rectangles goes up, while the approximate area still isn't the exact area, it is at least getting better. This, by the way, David, is a limiting process. So, what's the area, uh, not the area, excuse me, what's the width of each of these rectangles? One yes, the, the width of each of the rectangles, one tenth. Now, what's the first height? One tenth. One tenth. So, would you agree that the first rectangle is one over a hundred? Mm -hmm. What's the second rectangle? One tenth times two tenths, so two over hundred, and we can actually see a pattern now emerging. The next one's actually going to be three over hundred, and this is going to just keep going until we get to uh, the width one tenth times the height one tenth. So well, that's also ten over a hundred. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6, all the way up. Okay, well, wait a minute. We have done this before. Would you agree that that's equal to 1 over 100 times 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus da 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 all the way up to 10? Aha. Sigma from pre-calculus, yes. This is equal to 1 over 100 times the summation where k equals 1 to 10 of k. That's exactly right. And this part right here is equal to 55. So this becomes 55 over 100, which is 0.55. And we'll actually spend a lesson going back and reminding ourselves why that's the case. Now, right now, if you don't remember, we have to do it longhand, right? 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 5 is 15, blah, da 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 right? Okay? But there is a formula that we learned in pre-calculus to help us quickly calculate it. And it probably will take a little bit of time just to remember that. Okay, now, you may be asking yourself the question, 
why do all this? It's a triangle, right? Y equals X from 0 to 1 is a triangle. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. What's the area of a triangle again? Base times height divided by 2. So the base is 1. The height is 1. So what's the area of that triangle? 1 half. But notice that our approximation here using 10 rectangles was 0.55. Close, right? Not exact, obviously, but close, right? So why do all this? <laughs> yeah. It's because not every function in the universe is y equals x, right? Agreed? All right, sometimes you have a function f equals natural logarithm of x, which looks like this. And let's say you want to figure out what the area is from 1 to 5. So in order to do that successfully, you need a technique. And so the reason why we did all that on y equals x to help practice so that we could learn to use that on other functions. And this is the area problem. How to find the area underneath the curve from some point to some other point. Okay. All right, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to a, where a is the exact area under the curve. As you get more and more and more rectangles, the area approximation gets better and better and better and better and better. And that's the area. So this right here, everything that I've been showing you is called the method of rectangles. Oh, well. Yeah, you could call it that if you want. If you really want to, sure, you could call it that. All right. Let's use range my name. Mathematica here. All right. Okay. So this is the function right here. Eight minus two x squared. Does everyone see that? And I'm going to be on the interval from 0 to 2, and I'm just using, for right now, I'm going to use 10 rectangles. And I need to, there you are, I'm going to use the right-hand rule. Okay, so there we go. This is the function uh, 8 minus 2x squared from 0 to 2. Here's 10 rectangles using the right-hand rule. By the way, this is the last subinterval, right? Mm -hmm. So where's the rectangle? It's right zero. Yeah, the height is zero. And that happens sometimes. That's okay. So you're going to count only nine rectangles, but that's only because we're using the right hand rule. What if I was using the left hand rule instead? Yeah, I'd use the left hand side, and this would be what kind of an approximation? Over. It's over approximation right here. Midpoint rule would look like this. And you see now that the height, it comes from the sample, the midpoint sample of each subinterval right here. So you find the midpoint of each subinterval, plug that into the function to get the height, 
and now you have something that's a little bit over, a little bit under. That, by the way, Carrie, doesn't mean you have the exact, because the amount that it's over is not exactly the same as the amount that it's under. But you do have a chance of being a little bit better than what you did before. These three numbers right here use the right hand, uh, left hand, midpoint, and right hand rule. So if I use the left hand rule, I get 11.44. If I use the midpoint rule, I get uh, 9 point, excuse me. If I use the right hand rule, I get 9.84. And if I use the midpoint rule, I get 10.68. Let's just use more rectangles now. Let's go up to 50. Now, obviously, it's not going to be an exact area, but it's a lot better. Right? Here's the left hand, uh, right hand, and midpoint. Go up to 100. There's 100 rectangles using the midpoint rule. So this is the essence of the area problem right here. OK? OK. So a sub x equals the area under the curve of f of x from 0 to some point x. So if this is f of x, then a sub x represents the area underneath that curve of f from 0 to x. Okay. Now something interesting happens. If you take the derivative of a sub x, you get a prime of x, but that turns out to be f of x. So in other words, what that means is that if you find the area under the curve from 0 to an unknown point, a variable point x, what you're actually finding is the antiderivative of the function. The antiderivative. So in other words, capital A is the antiderivative of f, which means that the derivative of A is the function. This whole process of finding area is very closely related to finding what are called antiderivatives. An antiderivative carry is just going the other direction. So you know how to find the derivative of x cubed. What's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. But now here's the question. x cubed is, is the derivative of what function? x cubed is the derivative of what function? 1 fourth x to the fourth is one of the solutions. Yeah. Plus So what we do, whenever we find an antiderivative, we denote the antiderivative with a capital F. So this guy right here is the antiderivative of x cubed, because if you differentiate this, you get x cubed. Now that's the thing about antidifferentiation. Antidifferentiation is only good up to a constant, because what is the derivative of a constant? zero, which is why when you find an antiderivative, you've got to add in that constant because you don't know, McKenna, if it was a plus 10 or a minus 5,000 
because all the derivatives of those give you x cubed, right? So you don't know what the constant is. So that's why, Carrie, we have to say plus c. And all of this, by the way, came from finding the area problem. Again, a of x is what? a of x is the area under the curve of f from 0 to x. And it turns out that if we find the area, we're actually, without even realizing it, we're finding what's called the antiderivative which is what integration is all about. Okay. 7.1, there are only 10 problems. So those are the ones that you have to do. I've already done the first one for you. Number one, we did y equals x today. So you don't have to do number one. Okay. That is it for lesson 7.1 today. So for our posterity's sake, God bless you wherever you are today.